I am Sally Jo Michelson Cooper. Welcome to the Edge of My Mind. Let's jump off. This video is a method making video and I thought it would be a nice idea to go through journaling, um, both as form of diary type journaling and then also sketch journaling. And I got out a few of my notebooks and I thought I would go through some different strategies that I've used and talk about what's worked and what hasn't worked and different methods and practices and why I think journaling is important. Um, first I'd like to talk about just diary journaling. Um, I started journaling probably in high school. Um, when I first started doing it, I did it in just school book type books. Um, I didn't write down names or dates, I just wrote down stray thoughts, and even a journaling practice like that, I think, is better than nothing. Um, it was very therapeutic for me. I wrote down things um, that I was unable to articulate to people. Now, at that time, I didn't write down direct experience. I wrote down the poetic form. So I wrote down like really bad, kind of lame poetry about my feelings instead of actually my feelings. But maybe that's what I needed to do at the time. I don't think I was in touch enough with myself or who I was or who I could be to be able to articulate things realistically. Now, I think articulating things exactly is more useful. And while the poetic can be important and it can reach things you don't have words for yet, um, using it to avoid your real experience, not as beneficial as you might think. So I definitely think writing down real experience or real emotional experience is better than hiding in prose. Um, so when journaling started becoming really functional to me was when I started putting dates and times with it and basically what I started doing was I started applying um, the skills I had gotten from my analysis work in the army to my journaling, to my personal journaling. And the key features of that would be to write down time and date on everything and maybe location, all the W questions, who, what, where, why, how. And I really probably what or what wasn't so important, but um, when I started timing and dating it, that's when it really got order, it got reason, and it got useful. And when you time and date a journal, you're developing this really powerful psychological tool. And it's the ability to time travel. Um, you're sending your past self into the future by making it available. And you're giving your future self this handhold into your previous mind that you will cease to understand and that when you can look back on it and you can get that hold into your own past, you can begin to see where you are and who you were and you could compare yourself to yourself. And being able to compare myself to myself um, is where personal growth began for me. It's where really becoming something began for me and like I've been doing it for going on a decade and I feel like I'm just barely getting started. So as soon as you want to start doing that, if it's something that could be meaningful to you, I think you'll be astounded at what it will mean for you in five years time. And I don't mean that you have to sit down and journal every day, far from it. I mean, once every three months, once every three months, lay down your state of mind, even if it's just the state of mind for that 24 hours, because once every three months for 10 years becomes this just, it's just amazing. And then you're a friend to yourself because it doesn't matter if you put down your worst day or your best day, that frame of reference, um, it's so valuable. And I, I'll just describe it, I, I think maybe it saved my life at one point because I was in bad situations. I hadn't learned how to share my real self with anyone else yet. Um, and if you're not sharing your real self with anyone, you're robbing yourself of 
being able to see clearly because we don't just see with our own eyes. Other people help us see. But if you're scared and you're alone and you're dumb and you don't know how, and we're all dumb from time to time, and you don't know how to share with anyone else, you don't know how to get past embarrassment with anyone else, well, the beauty is you're human and you have an awareness of time and so you can start developing this relationship with yourself. So if you put down your thoughts and feelings and then you can compare your present thoughts and feelings with your past thoughts and feelings, you have like this other voice that can weigh in on your circumstance. And when I had someone who was lying to me consistently and then saying that I was a fool and just couldn't remember, and I couldn't prove it to myself, and I felt crazy, well, suddenly I could look back and I could say, no, no, this happened. I wrote this down right when it happened. And now it seems to be happening again. And it's doubtful that me from the past and me from the present are both wrong. And so you get this really powerful tool. And you don't have to write down, you don't have to write down intimate details of the practical for this to be useful. You can write down very benign things um, that can give you real power and understanding um, because you'll be referencing yourself, if that makes sense. So if you're concerned about someone else reading it, you could be, you can, you can do it without being direct and it can still be powerful. Like you could write down something as anecdotal as I went to see this person and we went to this place and we had toast and that made me sad. And just relating to yourself the experience of the relationship without any particulars that could make your situation worse were they to be divulged that can help you that can still be powerful now i i do think there's not a like unless you live with a lot of siblings or something um there's not a great risk in an analog item being taken away that's actually i don't recommend journaling digitally it's why journal in a hackable format I mean, unless you think there's a great risk of someone breaking into your house, and if they do break into your house, I mean, the idea that they want the minutia of your inner dialogue is just doubtful. Like, I don't know, maybe you have a stalker. Maybe I'll develop a stalker. Maybe I can sell my journals to my stalker. That would be an income revenue that hasn't been exploited. But anyway, um, so that's why I think journaling is powerful. Um, now, just practical things. I've tried a lot of different types of books. I've tried this uh, this magnetic type of book. I don't like them. Um, I find that this portion starts coming apart after a couple of years, and that annoys me. I also do not like books without lines because, as you can see, the lines just get... You, you can't write as much in them because you end up... You, you end up, like... Any, any of you that freeze frame and then read that, you're going to discover one thing. I am a terrible speller. I have always been a terrible speller. That's why I don't have a blog. Anyway, um, you just can't write as much in books that don't have the specific lines. So I recommend keeping books without lines for sketches and not for not for writing. And I don't, I don't recommend these. Um, I do like spiral bound books. Now, they are not my favorite. My favorite is Moleskin, but often you'll find these books um, on discount. So, they do last a long time. This one is my... started 2014. I probably bought it before then, and it's been to multiple states with me. It's got a little scuffing, but I probably bought it for five bucks, because I do look for these on sale. Um, and this is after, this is after I started really writing down, um, location and times, like, 
this is, I have a, a May 15th, 2015, 24 Muscadine, Lillington. It was where I was living. And that helps. Um, sometimes I write down really specific things. Like I, I just saw one of them that said kitchen island. And other times, let's see. Other times I just write down the house I was living at. I'm trying not to share specific addresses because I don't, I don't know. I've lived a lot of places. Probably wouldn't matter. Um, I know sometimes I write down, like, if I'm writing in a cafe, it's really, I think it's really fun to write down, like, cafe and, like, the whole address of the cafe. And then, oh, this is something I love to do. I love to um, tape in movie tickets or tape in, like, this was our Christmas card one year. Or I like business cards. Uh... Business cards. Oh, here we go. I completely forgot about this place. So this was like a little coffee shop that I really enjoyed while I was living there. Um, and for me, I'm a very visual thinker, so the little icons of places helps me. Like I can, I can completely visualize this roaster looking at that icon. Um, yeah, and so like did this. This was one of my dates with my now husband. Um, so I like, I like doing that. I really, I love taping things in. Now, it's really helpful if you can tape things in in chronological order. Often, I was unsuccessful with that, so the last couple of pages just ends in, like, a ridiculous amount of business cards and paraphernalia. Um, so yeah, the Spider-Man ones. This is... Yeah, this is another one of those that didn't have lines. And the the benefit to not having lines if you're a sketcher is you can just take out and just completely put in a sketch. And that is good. I went in and out of how much I want to combine um, my sketching and my journaling notebooks. Um, I went from trying to have really, really segmented journals and sketchbooks to really, really integrated. This was an integrated phase where I was trying to put my sketch work in with my journaling. I've moved away from that. I keep sketch sketches in one sets of books and journals. I try and have an, another. Um, this is a book from art school. And as far as sketchbooks go, I don't know. It was okay. I find this size to be too big. I don't like this size. Um, you think you want it. You think you need the space um, for ideas and stuff. And when it comes down to it, the most practical sketchbook is the sketchbook you have carried with you. Because if you have a giant book like this, you end up not bringing it. And if you don't bring it, then you don't sketch. So I found the best size sketchbook for me are these. And my favorite of these are the moleskin, like the true moleskin one. Let me see. Yeah, this is a this is a moleskin. And like they're not these ones aren't that expensive because they come in little packs, and I kind of, I mean, it depends on what phase of life I am. I kind of tear through them. This is a, this is a flying hot dog. Hot dog is a particular call sign in the service that is humorous, if you know what it means. Um, this is like a pen drawing. These are doodles from work. So this is one of the little sketchbooks that would get with me to work. Um, sometimes. I think this is the book I had in Afghanistan. Let's see. Let's see if there's this Humvee. Yeah, here we go. So, that is like the one painting I did of the stand while I was there. Um, yeah, so I like these little sketchbooks. These are my favorite. This is what I'm actually trying to stick with. I used it in school, which I'm not sure how I got away with it because they really wanted 
you to use bigger books, but oh, it was so much. I, I would rather have a small book and then change it when I was done with that class than a giant book that was just everything. But there's downside to that too, because what if you don't use it all? And if I don't use it all, I have a propensity to like go back. Um, this is one of my projects that I did actually end up sort of doing. I'll get it out at some point and show you guys. Um, ah, this is the original Pizza Chad. He's uh, available on my Notepad Guts uh, collection. All right, so other failed strategies. At one point, I thought I wanted my dreams in a separate book. And then I didn't anymore. And I, at one point I had a journal journal, like just chronological journal, and then I had a dream journal, and then I had a prayers journal, and then I had a work journal, and then I had sketch journals, and that was too many journals. It was not functional. So now I do dreams and prayers and regular journaling in a chronological form that's one journal. Um, I do keep separate books for work because I find it is awkward if you have your regular journal and then you're trying to flip through that to find phone numbers or accounts or whatever. So for instance, my crazy stickered up book is my work book and I'd like it to be more organized, but it's it's organized enough for me and I won't show you because I keep passwords in it and I think all the ones on that page were old passwords, but um, I keep passwords, I keep sale records, I keep contacts, I keep that all in one journal and I actually really like having analog and I know people use those password keys. I don't enjoy the password keys. I like the hard feel of it. Now, it should all be in one and I have like three going on right now, so I need to recondense them and cease um, having them separate. I actually, this is probably my all time favorite journal. This was my first moleskin, and I got it for Christmas from one of my cousins. And then I found out man, uh, there's a difference in notebooks, and I started getting more and more of them. Um, I find journals, especially things that you're going to carry to work and stuff. Maybe this is my second one. Maybe I have another moleskin. I don't know. Anyway, um, but journals are a good place to put something that can help you when you're stressed out. Like on this journal, I wrote my little affirmation that pretty much got me through my last two years of being in the service. And it's, I will develop a plan of action based on the reality of what is possible. And this is one of those things that if you're spiraling with negative thinking, something like that to pull yourself out um, in a journal, or, or yeah, it wouldn't have to be a journal. I also had it written on the inside of a headgear. Uh, but anyway, that's a really useful function of journals. Let's see. So sketchbooks. I do recommend, if you're doing sketchbooks for art or for a drawing practice, if you have verbal thoughts about said work while you're drawing it, if you can bring it upon yourself to write them on the next page or below it, do it. Do it. And also dating your sketches. Date your sketches just like dating your, your other stuff. because. You'll lose your frame of mind, you'll lose the context, and it's just, it, it, it's so much more useful. And then, too, you'll, you'll criticize yourself out of turn because you won't remember what year it was done. And as you progress, your older sketches are going to look like they were done by someone else because they were. They were done by the other person that you're not anymore. And so that information is just... It's just invaluable to give yourself that reference to yourself. So, I've got personal journals, those kind of, okay. Last but not least, I wanna go through two types of, I don't know what these would be, like compilement uh, journals. 
I guess. Um, the first one, this is actually a book from my brief time at Cambridge. Uh, I was accepted to Anglia Ruskin School of Art and Design in England, and I promptly lost all my money and couldn't continue to go. But for the glorious month and a half that I was there, this was one of my projects, was to start putting all of my sketches into one book. And what they actually meant was they wanted me to get one of these books and do my sketches in a rational manner and write with them. But at the time, I couldn't understand the academic world enough to take hints. So I was like, oh, I'll make a book. And <laughs> to their kind of dismay, I did this little monstrosity. And I took pictures of my sketches from the random places that they were and printed them off and then wrote about them here instead of writing about them in my journal. But the cool thing about this was it allowed me also to take the full paintings and some of these paintings I don't have anymore and they were on canvases and stuff and then put them in here. Maybe it wasn't a canvas. No, I think it was. These are like, this is all from like 2008. So it's ancient history in my art world, but, um, and then I was able to put uh, influencing pictures along with my sketches, along with my thoughts. And so, while I don't really like how this turned out, I definitely don't like how clunky this book is, I can see where it might suit someone. Maybe it would suit you more to do it digitally, because um, I wouldn't worry as much about doing something like this digitally as I would like a personal journal. But you can see, like, this was like, in progress, learning how to try to do a thing. 3D clouds still kind of frustrate me. And then, like, progression. So this is a strategy, and I wouldn't say it's an unuseful one. Um, I probably won't do it this way again, but it's an idea. It's like, old works. Um, that's that. Uh, this book, and this is something I would say, if you're using a specific kind of paper, and you're doing multiple drawings, it can give them a cohesion, and also it, it's a form. It's a form unto itself. So in this book, I was designing plants, and these plants actually were supposed to belong to my brother's book, but I'm not sure. That's probably in a series of old notebooks too. Um, and I don't like all of them, but they're little watercolors. And these were like a series of magical plants we were making for a world. Um, and I actually kind of really liked the lines, which is why I'm bringing this up. Like, I like the idea of these lines, and I like the idea of doing it kind of like the botanical, or botanical sketches, and like continuing in that history. I think if I were to do this again, I would do this on a kind of a manila paper. Um, but you can see sometimes the lines can be an asset. And they just really changed the style. So I didn't want to discount it. I kind of wanted to throw it in. And it's, it's probably a weird, probably one of my weirdest little books is this book and these little, the story about these little plants. But anyway, and now, straight from the university, I bring you my visual library. We had a visiting artist. Um, and this visiting artist talked about having a visual library. And if you are a painter or anybody working in the visual arts, you'll know one of your biggest things you end up with is you need shadow models, um, shapes, patterns, all of that stuff to give you the exactness on the end of your form. And you end up collecting like weird stuff like I found like like the most beautiful broken leaf or dragonfly wings, or bird skulls, or just weird stuff like that. 
Well, this visiting, visiting artist um, described this all, and she explained this is her visual library. And I'm like, dang, I like that. Visual library. And then when you're in art school, you have to bring five to ten representations of the idea of the shapes and colors and forms and influences that you're going for. Uh, that's usually part of your project, is to find five to ten representational things. And so I was always printing stuff off. And it just, I was printing stuff off that I liked, like images of stuff that I liked, and then pitching it. And I was like, well, that seems stupid. And so I came up with this brainchild that I would make a visual library uh, just in, it's a little disorganized right now, just in this uh, page protector folder. And I actually, I'm a huge fan of page protectors because I like to gut my old notebooks and put the pages that I like into page protector files. <laughs> This is probably a terrible way of going about it. If I had just be organized from the onset, I wouldn't have to do that. Now this one, I need, you see what has happened here. I need to go get more page protectors and finish this out, but disregarding this, um, what I have put in here is a variety of artists who I like their styles. So kicking off the whole thing, I have some works of Deb Doolittle, and it just gives you like, you can immediately drop into these mindsets and these orientations when you are looking at those type of images. And so I have her, and then I have my aunt, if, if any of my family ever watches this, I don't know. Maybe that's terrifying to think that they would, but. Um, I have my aunt Ruth uh, Mayer, and these are some of her signature works or works that I just really liked of hers. Um, and then I went into metalsmiths, of course, because I did metalsmithing in school. This is an artist who's actually in the Dakotas that I will probably go track down someday. Um, this is John Lopez. He probably is one of my biggest inspirations, too, although I don't. I don't like the menagerie stuff as much as I used to, but he was one of the only really serious sculpture artists that I knew that was living when I was young. So anyway, and then I also, because I am, because I am ridiculous, I also view the provocation, like the, the propagation of brands as being its own art. So I got really obsessed with some certain veteran companies for a while. Like, I like the whole Black Rifle coffee motif. Um, I like fake patches. I don't wear them, which is really weird, but I like the fake patches. So this is like a whole collection of the fake patches that military members give each other as jokes. Um, this is grunt style. Like, just, I was in, look at that. Um, what is this? Oh, this is a Lewis Sullivan metal piece. So you get the idea here. I was just collecting different motifs that I like for reference. Um, I also went into leatherworking art, um, bead art. Uh, that's a huge influence on my color schemes. You probably actually recognize the way some of my color schemes work is referencing some of these bead art. Um, the, the way color is completely separated in bead art really influences my painting. Um, figuring out how to use that in a way where the colors can blend into each other, that's been its own little thing that I've been doing. Um, these are just little sculptures. This is, uh, of course, Black Hills Gold is an influence on my work, um, because I'm from the Dakotas. Hopefully I don't say that too many times. I'm specifically from South Dakota because just saying the Dakotas will annoy people from the Dakotas. Um, Montana Silver influences my work. Ah, oh, this is a uh, some this was a company that does electro for me, and I was keeping track of how much they were selling things for because I thought that was a really good reference to have because when you're making art products, it is like. I've got more of a method down now because 
if you keep track of your hours and you keep track of your materials, at least you have a starting point with price. Um, but trying to learn how to do that, I decided to do reference images with the information from the website. Now, you know what would have made this whole thing better? Oh, wait, I put it here. So this is all from 2017. So that really ups the information because uh, would this be 229 right now? Well, it's 2020, so everything's insane, so I have no idea. But, in general, 10 years from now, this wouldn't be good information if it didn't also have the date. Um, what else is in here? Oh, uh, just different electroforming examples. Um, I decided to add in cattle brands. Um, I think that's an influence on my work. It's a definitely its own little language style. Uh, so I wanted that. Um, then I have military insignias, and then I have map, uh, map coordinates, map reading icons, uh, military symbols in general. I find them interesting. They're like a little sub-language, so I enjoy that. Of course, the regular map reading stuff, that's, anybody sh should know that information, but anyway. Probably red versus blue thing. And I get into more in this visual library. Weird plants? I think that's, I don't know. Of course you have Google and you can do this on Google, but sometimes you can't get back to the same thing. And you can see here, I'm not doing a whole page for each image. I just put them together. This is frogfish. I, they're a fun creature to me. Um, more art pieces. There's a huge push when you're in art school to uh, look at other artists' work, which is good. I find it a little exhausting, but it's good. Um, then I have general uh, web stuff that I started collecting in my visual library. Okay, these are prominent figures. So I have Peterson, I have Tesla, uh, I have Gregor Mendel. Um, yeah, this is specific artists. So this probably was part of an assignment to put together certain people. Uh, I have John Paul Miller, my absolute favorite uh, metalsmith. If you want to look at some of the most phenomenal uh, enamel work you've ever seen in your life, John Paul Miller. Uh, yep, there's a little Viking pipe. I don't know, I wasn't gonna just show you the whole book, but I guess that's kind of what I'm doing now. Um, these are just examples of medieval art. So here's an example where I was just looking for the pose, and these are actually the pose references I used in my Sands of Time series um, when I did my little spaceman and when I did my little hunter that's hunting the dragon in uh, Confronting Chaos. So you can see, these aren't exactly the guy that I made at all, but these are the references that I used from that. And these are landscape references, which I probably integrated a little bit. I don't know how specifically I use these images. Craters on the moon, asteroids. Yeah, these are from the Sands of Time. There's al alchemical symbols. I just... The languages of information and symbology. And then when you're using the big uh, binders, you can add in these folders. So if you just need to stuff stuff in, I have my philosophy of art and some of that stuff in here. Other people can view my work. So you can get really in depth with these. Oh man. So here's where, here's where I just kind of went into my own imagery. That's one of the, if you've never looked up Books of Hours, they're gorgeous. Um, but I was just studying these informational languages for a while. Those are, these are a solar flare thing that happens when it's really cold weather. You've probably seen them in my work. Um, this is the model from 
what is the name of that piece? The girl with the tree. Willful Wondering. Yeah, this is the model who posed for that for me. And this is muscle structures of bears and stuff that I use for my monsters. I actually have a bear, a cow, a mountain lion, and a bulldog, and a man all in this page to look back. Um, and that's what makes the difference between doing monsters that look like they're made out of jello inside and then actually look like they're made out of something inside. So anyway, this has been my visual library. I probably will continue to make more visual libraries as I work on pieces. Any of the reference imagery that gets kind of scattered around eventually will go into some type of visual library. Like this guy right here, he needs to go into a visual library. I maybe should start a new one for this year, but what else? Is there anything else? Um, there is this type of squared off paper. And there are actually a lot of different types of versions of paper with different lines and spacing. And if you're trying to do really nice hand lettering or really specific technical drawings, you can kind of do the same thing I've done with any of this stuff on that grid paper. Um, and that is a way to go. I don't usually like the books that it's in. I, I often find it in uh, this format, and this just isn't an enjoyable carry format for me. But I've actually seen it on these little moleskins too. So, all right, that was probably a way overdone video on ridiculous amounts of journaling. And I haven't even went into all of my journals, but um, if you like the journaling, I could do more videos. Maybe I'll have to do a more succinct video on journaling in the future. But um, I hope you enjoyed walking through them with me, and I hope you have a great day.